winning hackathon strategies from a contestant who wins second place at least 77% of the time. I'm Tanya Hall and joining me is Justin Halsell, developer advocate at IBM. Welcome, Justin. Hello, thank you for having me. Absolutely. How have you served as a mentor to hackathon competitors? Uh, well, um, one of the things that I really like to do is kind of share my story um, with, with hackathon developers, especially if someone's new, they don't really know how hackathons work, all that kind of stuff. Then I'll kind of share the, some of the learnings, some of the anecdotes that I have had. And uh, this is, uh, even though I'm, I've never been super successful at hackathons, I'm really, really good at winning second prize. Like, uh, my rate is 77% of the time I win second prize, but I've been able to kind of like coach people into winning first prize. So it's, you know, as a good mentor, you want your students to be, to, to be able to reach further than, you, than you've uh, been able to do. Um, and the most successful has been a uh, uh, now friend of mine uh, who ended up winning $200,000 at the last IBM uh, hackathon, which is kind of cool. There's no shame in being second place, at least not when there's more than two competitors. What happens at a typical hackathon? Uh, well, a lot of people get together. Um, they get some, some tools kind of thrown at them and they really use all of their creativity as, uh, and, and they get just hacking away and building something in the shortest amount of time um, possible, really. Uh, often it's like 24 hours or 36 hours or whatever. And they then create something that is hopefully really, really cool and enticing and interesting and pitch that to the audience, to the judges, and then hopefully win some prizes. And throughout the whole process, um, they consume a vast amount of caffeine because often it's, it's over, uh, yeah, it's over like overnight and uh, they have a lot of fun. What strategies do winners employ? Well, um, I think uh, one of the things that I've seen happen a lot is kind of doing some prep work, getting a team together, getting a team together that kind of really works well together, uh, not taking too much of a technical uh, leap. So they'll use some tools that they're comfortable with. They'll uh, involve some new tools as well, um, but they'll, they'll try and not, kind of get too far outside of their comfort zone when they're, when they're building something. And then uh, one of the things that often really works is kind of, you know, tugging on those heartstrings a little bit, doing a pitch where the, the jury members are like, well, you know, if we let them win, then that's better for the world. Even though often, you know, you're just building this in a weekend and, and often it doesn't really evolve past that. Although there's, there's some, you know, there's some things like Angel Hack, which try and help uh, help the um, hackathon project move, uh, live live longer, basically. What skill sets should fill out the team? Well, I you definitely need developers, right? Without them, it's not really a hackathon. You should get some uh, some designers along as well. You know, at least one because. You're building this thing, it's super hacky, it's gonna be, you know, it's gonna be kind of terrible at, at the back end. And if that kind of seeps through to the front of it, then uh, your audience is gonna be like, oh my God, what's this? Um, so having a developer that can kind of polish it up and make it a little bit more understandable, um, that really, really helps. And also, you know, sometimes if you really wanna, I really want this project to live beyond where uh, yeah, live beyond the weekend or where, whenever you're working on this project. Um, it's nice to have like a business person involved that can kind of think through the um, business model and, and see, you know, see how it fits within the con competitive landscape. And also at the end of the day, it's really nice if you have like a jury member that asks you a really, really tough question uh, to be able to be like, Oh, well, business person over here, why don't you answer that? Um, that's helped me out a couple times at least. What types of tools are absolutely necessary? Um, none. I think you can, you, can do, you can do whatever you want, which is kind of one of the exciting thing about hackathons. You know, really just going, going wild, experiencing uh, or experimenting with, uh, with new stuff. 
so I don't think there's anything that's absolutely necessary. You could, you could make a hardware uh, hack and uh, you, you could solder some things together. Um, but of course, you know, the, the usual suspects, kind of like the tools that you're very productive with, um, are basically the, the good tools to, to reach to. And just to have some fun, you know, experiment with something that's new, that's new to you at least. Um, but yeah, get, get a bit creative. Use, use whatever's uh, kind of within, within reach. I would steer clear of something that's massive, very opinionated, and you've never used before. Like, um, I remember trying to learn Angular at a uh, hackathon and uh, having never done it before and being like, oh, wow, this is huge. Uh, yeah, I'm never, never going to be able to get uh, really productive with this uh, before, the end of the, uh, before the end of the event. And then, like, halfway through, we basically threw all of our uh, JavaScript code away and we just started just coding plain vanilla just because we could be productive that way. And, yeah, ended up actually being able to show something uh, as opposed to otherwise just having some horrendously buggy uh, Angular code. Although maybe it wouldn't seem important to somebody who's not in this hacking community, how important are creature comforts like snacks, drinks, pillows, and such? Well, um, I, that's, that's, good. that's a good question. I th you definitely you definitely want to bring you know your well I don't know it depends how long the hackathon is the longer the, it is the uh, the more important these things are right um, being hunched over your laptop uh, for uh, 24 hours is you know you'll have some back pain and and you'll feel a little bit uh, disaligned for the rest of the week but it's okay doing that for 48 hours. Uh, not great. So then you, then you have to bring in your keyboard and your stand and all that kind of stuff. Um, having some caffeinated drinks to be able to kind of uh, keep you productive throughout the night is nice. But if you want to pitch, uh, it's also really, really important to actually get some sleep. And I remember I kind of like walking off the wrong side of the stage at the end of a hackathon because I hadn't really slept for two weeks, you know. So, and if you're answering questions and your mind's uh, not right because you're you're basically um, on the edge of not having any uh, having had any sleep, then you're going to answer questions weirdly, and you're not going to not going to get very far. How do you maintain? I mean, you talk about these long durations, and a lot. Yeah. Of, I'm sure there's just a lack of sleep, as you mentioned. How do you maintain positive energy in your team under stress? Well, that's a tr that's a that's a, a tricky one. That's very much a tricky one. That's that's why it's important to kind of get people that you kind of know a bit. Um, you know, bring bring along friends. So that is definitely helpful because there's already kind of like there's there's a trust uh, that you've built up there. And then if you get a little bit snippy, then you know you can still build on the trust that you've uh, you've built up before. Um, but yeah, it can, it can be really tough. And sometimes, you know, as, as a team member, you kind of have to stay vigilant. If two people are getting, you know, picky at each other or whatever, getting snappy, then maybe you need to step in and, and just, you know, move something along. I remember um, uh, one of my team members having some issues with, with Git, and I was getting really frustrated with him. And I kind of pushed him aside and just kind of did it myself because that would be the, the, the least the least frustrating to me, which is not great for him, but you know, it kind of got the job done. Anyway, you're under a lot of stress. You need to understand that as well. And you need to understand that your team members, you're probably not going to see the prettiest side of them after 48 hours of hacking and just four hours of sleep. Um, so it's, it's, it's okay. You need to do, you need to kind of accept it to a certain extent. You mentioned that you've got a story. So what's the story behind your penchant for achieving runner up status? Well, one of, the, one of the things that I really like to do, which really works well for me, is kind of inject some humor into, into what we're doing. Uh, that, that always kind of like connects with the audience. It's, it's kind of good. I add in the problem that I'm solving uh, at the very beginning of the, uh, of the pitch to kind of frame what we're doing. I think that is always really, really valuable, and that kind of gets you uh, in front of a lot of your competitors. Um, one of the things that I'll do is I'll, I'll inject kind of artificial constraints, uh, constraints that otherwise, 
you know, wouldn't, well, I don't know, there's the constraints that I, um, that I came up with. And these constraints will often be such that um, we'll be able to remove some user experience piece of it and kind of make the application simpler. So, for example, we built this thing called Beat for Speed. And Beat for Speed allowed you to uh, listen to music depending on the speed that you were driving. This was before, uh, before Alexa, all of that kind of stuff. And um, there was, if you were riding a motorcycle, you had to kind of like pull over to change what you were listening to. And so that's what we kind of built. We decided we want to make a music app for people that can't interact with music apps. Um, so we built this thing called, uh, called Beat for Speed. And there was a lot of user, uh, yeah, user interface that we didn't have to build because we were purely going to look at the speed that you're driving. Um, basically, and then that um, kind of like you know, uh, kind of pitching that ended up uh, us winning, ended up with us winning second prize, and ended up with uh, Spotify actually giving us the prize. And then, like 11 months later, introducing their own thing called um, Spotify Running, which is exactly the same principle, even their ad was very, very similar to our. Um, uh, to our pitch as well. So it's like that's one of the using constraints uh, to kind of innovate in that way um, and then injecting some humor into it kind of gets us really, really far and then it inspires us off or inspires the, uh, the jury members often to take that back to their work and then pitch it to their boss and have it be built uh, and us not get any credit for it. That's, that kind of happens pretty much every time. Uh, well, four times. Let's say it's happened four times. If someone wants to connect with you, Justin, uh, Justin Halsell, developer advocate at IBM, if somebody wants to connect with you, maybe they want Mixology, uh, you know, questions. Yes, of course. They, yeah, yeah. They want a sample from that wall behind you. Um, what's the best way they can do that? Uh, they can connect with me uh, on Twitter at, uh, at Juice10. And uh, yeah, ask me any questions. Uh, you know, get some cocktail recommendations or something like that. Sounds good. And if you guys want to find more of my interviews, you can do that right here or go to tanyahall.net. Thanks for watching.